Hello, America. My name is Dylan John, and you are listening to the Neo-Fusionist Book Review. This is not your typical book review, as I make no claims to political or philosophical impartiality. This podcast uses the format of a book review to explore the premise of neo-fusionism. Neo-fusionism is the merging of paleoconservatism with naturalism within the framework of the revitalization of the Republican Party. We will be exploring politics, philosophy, psychology, economics, and sociology through a wide variety of books published both recently and historically. Thank you for tuning in. So, for today's episode, we'll be looking at a book called The Roots of Romanticism by Isaiah Berlin. And this book was originally delivered as a series of lectures in 1965 and then was published in 1999 for the first time uh, after Isaiah Berlin had passed away. And it explores Romanticism as a response to the Enlightenment, and it looks at some of the earliest uh, Romantic thinkers, particularly German Romantic thinkers. The Enlightenment was largely uh, a Western European, particularly a French um, and also uh, British and Scottish uh, phenomenon, but it really was centered in France and centered in Paris. And so that's sort of what the Germans are responding to is the French idea. Now, there were some Germans who uh, maybe were could be considered part of the Enlightenment, but it definitely was not the center of the Enlightenment. Ger- Germany was much more the center of the Romantic response to the Enlightenment. So I've got a few sections I'm going to read here. Uh, the first of them is going to just be sort of an explanation of the Enlightenment, a short and sweet explanation in case you didn't catch the last episode when I talked about the Enlightenment. And actually, this kind of uh, looks at it a little bit uh, differently. It explores some premises that serve as, I guess, the foundation of Western civilization in a way, or at least that's how it is described. Uh, And I'm going to go ahead and read it to you now, and then I'll give you a little bit of response to it. So the author says, quote, The Enlightenment of the late 17th and early 18th centuries needs some definition. There are three propositions, if we may boil it down to that, which are, as it were, the three legs upon which the whole Western tradition rested. They are not confined to the Enlightenment, although the Enlightenment offered a particular version of them, transformed them in a particular manner. The three principles are roughly these. First, that all genuine questions can be answered. We may not know what the answer is, but someone will. We may be too weak or too stupid or too ignorant to be able to discover the answer for ourselves. In that case, the answer may perhaps be known to persons wiser than us, to experts, an elite of some sort. We may be sinful creatures and therefore incapable of ever arriving at the truth by ourselves. In that case, we shall not know it in this world, but perhaps in the next. Or perhaps it was known in some golden age before the fall and the flood had rendered us as weak and as sinful as we are. Or perhaps the golden age is not in the past, but in the future, and we shall discover the truth then, if not here, there, if not now, at some other time. But in principle, the answer must be known, if not to men, then at any rate to an omniscient being, to God, if the answer is not knowable at all, if the answer is in some way, in principle, shrouded from us, then there must be something wrong with the question." This is a proposition which is common both to Christians and to scholastics, to the Enlightenment, and to the positivist tradition of the 20th century. It is, in fact, the backbone of the main Western tradition, and it is this that Romanticism cracked. The second proposition is that all these answers are knowable, that they can be discovered by means which can be learnt and taught to other persons, that there are techniques by which it is possible to learn and to teach ways of discovering what the world consists of, what part we occupy in it, what our relation is to people, what our relation is to things, what true values are, and the answer to every other serious and answerable question. The third proposition is that the answers must be compatible with each other, because if they are not compatible, then chaos will result. It is clear that the true answer to one question cannot be incompatible, with the true answer to another question. It is a logical truth that one true proposition cannot contradict another. If all the answers to all questions are to be put in the form of propositions, and if all true propositions are in principle discoverable, 
then it must follow that there is a description of an ideal universe, a utopia, if you like, which is simply that which is described by all true answers to all serious questions. This utopia, although we may not be able to attain to it, is at any rate that ideal in terms of which we can measure off our own present imperfections. Those are the general presuppositions of the rationalist Western tradition, whether Christian or pagan, whether theist or atheist. The particular twist which the Enlightenment gave to this tradition was to say that the answers were not to be obtained in many of the hitherto traditional ways. I need not dwell on that, for it will be familiar. The answer is not to be obtained by revelation, for different men's revelations appear to contradict each other. It is not to be obtained by tradition, because tradition can be shown to be often misleading and false. It is not to be obtained by dogma. It is not to be obtained by the individual self-inspection of men of a privileged type, because too many impostors have usurped this role, and so forth. There is only one way of discovering these answers, and that is by the correct use of reason, deductively, as in the mathematical sciences, inductively, as in the sciences of nature. That is the only way in which answers in general, true answers to serious questions, may be obtained. There is no reason why such answers, which, after all, have produced triumphant results in the worlds of physics and chemistry, should not equally apply to the much more troubled fields of politics, ethics, and aesthetics. The general pattern I wish to stress of this notion is that life, or nature, is a jigsaw puzzle. We lie among the disjected fragments of this puzzle. There must be some means of putting these pieces together. The all-wise man, the omniscient being, whether God or an omniscient earthly creature, whichever way you like to conceive it, is in principle capable of fitting all the various pieces together into one coherent pattern. Anyone who does this will know what the world is like, what things are, what they have been, what they will be, what the laws that govern them are, what man is, what the relationship of man is to things, and therefore what man needs, what he desires, and also how to obtain it. All questions, whether of a factual nature or of what we call a normative nature, questions such as what should I do, or what ought I to do, or what would it be right or appropriate for me to do, all these questions are answerable by someone who is capable of fitting together the pieces of the jigsaw puzzle. It is like a hunt for some kind of concealed treasure. The only difficulty is to find the path to the treasure. Upon this, of course, Theorists have differed, but in the 18th century there was a fairly wide consensus that what Newton had achieved in the region of physics could surely also be applied to the regions of ethics and of politics, end quote. Okay, so um, the interesting thing about this is, is that it, it hits a couple of different things, and I think that on the whole I tend to agree with this in principle. Uh, I think that the, the world is essentially... Uh, fixed, and that it operates in a certain specific way that science can uncover. All right, I I tend to believe in a in a fairly deterministic. Well, I guess I believe in a, a completely deterministic materialistic world. Um, there's no supernatural anything. It's all natural, and it's all cause and effect. It's all observable. It's all recordable. If you had the if you had equipment that was sophisticated enough to record it and process it and translate it into something that could be comprehensible to humans. Now, the big problem here is with complex systems, the complexity of many of the systems of nature. Uh, they just don't allow for uh, prediction or comprehension to such a granular degree that we could really understand. Like, like to be able to really, really accurately predict the weather, I don't think we will ever be able to have the sort of perfect weather prediction that would be, that, that, you know, it would require such, a, such a precise measurement of, of all partic these particular, I mean, if you were to try to say predict what the weather will be like in 10 years from now on Tuesday, July 4th. You, you know, the, the systems are so remarkably complex that that level of precise prediction is practically impossible. Now, that doesn't mean that it's not, in theory, predictable. But we aren't capable of predicting it. We may never be capable of predicting it to that degree. 
It's just not realistic. And I think that the human mind is a is a an extremely complex system. Uh, and every single person has an extremely complex system of their own in their heads. And so to, uh, to achieve that level of precise understanding of human behavior is not really possible. Um, th- that th- isn't to say that we don't understand more and more about the human mind, but um, I think it's a mistake to try to say that we can achieve in any really significant, accurate prediction of human behavior or understanding of human behavior on that sort of level. And so uh, there are a host of other methods of knowing human behavior that are based on feeling and intuition. And we're equipped with the mes- methods to to create approximate understandings of what other people may be thinking. We won't know exactly, but you can kind of get an idea from their facial expressions or the context of the words that they say, etc. You can get an idea for what's going on in someone's head that you you can, can instinctually understand because you're equipped with a complex system that is able, able, to, able to approximately comprehend another complex system, but a scientific, meticulous approach can never achieve that degree of understanding. So that's kind of what that's kind of where I where I come down on 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 this enlightenment notion and where it seems to fail. Now, if you have um, if you have like 18th century technology, 17th century technology to try to understand and predict human behavior, the the models are going to have to be so incredibly simplistic. Uh, that they're not really going to be particularly accurate. And I think that uh, there was a kind of trust in reason to such an extent that all of our, all of our hardwired methods and all of the, the process of tradition that we explored when we've talked about Edmund Burke, the, that process that develops uh, the systems within which we operate that are designed in order to in order to work with human nature and to bring out the best in us in order to uh, help society function smoothly, if you can't look at that and immediately comprehend um, all of the scientific basis for it, then therefore you should discard it. Um, I'm not really, I, I don't really agree with that. I don't think that's appropriate. And yet that's kind of what the Enlightenment does. They look at those those systems that are maybe more based on uh, intuitive impressions and best practices through history, and and it, sa- and it says if you can't break this down scientifically, and if it's not thoroughly based on reason, if there are components of supernatural X, Y, or Z within it, then get rid of it. It's not going to work. I'm very skeptical about that. Uh, as we talked about in the last episode a little bit. And, and this kind of uh, le- leads from there into Romanticism. So now that we looked at that, let's look at some of the responses to that idea. So there are two individuals that I want to talk about that are, are uh, discussed in this book. Uh, the first is Johann Georg Hamann, and the second is Johann Gottfried Herder. And so he talks about both of these individuals, Haman first and then Herder. Uh, and I'm going to go ahead and read these two sections. We'll start with Haman. And I think this is really interesting how these men respond to this. It's really something that I think we as conservatives should take to heart. I think there's components of the romantic movement that we should take to heart. And I think you'll understand as as I read this. So he says, quote, the French dealt in the general propositions of the sciences, but these general propositions never caught the actual living, palpitating reality of life. If you met a man and wished to know what he was like, to clap upon him various psychological and sociological generalizations gleaned from the works of Montesquieu or Condillac would teach you nothing. The only way to discover what human beings were like was by speaking to them, by communicating with them. Communication meant an actual meeting of two human beings, and by watching a man's face, and by watching the contortions of his body and his gestures, by hearing his words, and in many other ways which you could not afterwards analyze, you became convinced 
a datum was presented to you. You knew to whom it was you were talking. Communication was established. The attempt to analyze this communication into scientific general propositions would of necessity fail. General propositions were baskets of an extremely crude kind. They were concepts and categories which differentiated that which was common to a great many things, common to many men of different sorts, common to many things of different sorts, common to various ages. What they left out, of necessity because they were general, was that which was unique, that which was particular, that which was the specific property of this particular man or this particular thing. And that alone was of interest, according to Haman. If you wished to read a book, you were not interested in what this book had in common with many other books. If you looked at a picture, you did not wish to know what principles had gone into the making of this picture, principles which had also gone into the making of a thousand other pictures, in a thousand other ages by a thousand different painters. You wished to react directly to the specific message, to the specific reality, which looking at this picture, reading this book, speaking to this man, praying to this God, would convey to you. From this, he drew a kind of Bergsonian conclusion. Namely, that there was a flow of life, and that the attempt to cut this flow into segments killed it. The sciences were very well for their own purposes. If you wish to discover about how to grow plants, and even then not always correctly, if you wished to know about some kind of general principles, about the general principles of bodies in general, whether physical or chemical, if you wished to know what climates would assist what kind of growth to develop in them, and so forth, then no doubt the sciences were very well. But this is not what men ultimately sought. If you asked yourself, what were men after? What did men really want? You would see that what they wanted was not at all what Voltaire supposed they wanted. Voltaire thought that they wanted happiness, contentment, peace. But this was not true. What men wanted was for all their faculties to play in the richest and most violent possible fashion. What men wanted was to create. What men wanted was to make. And if this, if this making led to clashes, if it led to wars, if it led to struggles, then this was part of the human lot. A man who had been put in a Voltairean garden, pared and pruned, who had been brought up by some wise philosoph in knowledge of physics and chemistry and mathematics, and in knowledge of all the sciences which the encyclopedists had recommended, such a man would be a form of death in life. The sciences, if they were applied to human society, would lead to a kind of fearful bureaucratization, he thought. He was against scientists, bureaucrats, Persons who made things tidy, smooth Lutheran clergymen, deists, everybody who wanted to put things in boxes, everybody who wished to assimilate one thing to another, who wished to prove, for example, that creation was really the same as the obtaining of certain data which nature provides and their rearrangement in certain pleasing patterns. Whereas for Haman, of course, creation was a most ineffable, indescribable, unanalyzable personal act by which a human being laid his stamp on nature, allowed his will to soar spoke his word, uttered that which was within him, and which would not brook any kind of obstacle. Therefore, the whole of the Enlightenment doctrine appeared to him to kill that which was living in human beings, appeared to offer a pale substitute for the creative energies of man, and for the whole rich world of the senses, without which it is impossible for human beings to live, to eat, to drink, to be merry, to meet other people, to indulge in a thousand and one acts, without which people wither and die. It seemed to him that the Enlightenment laid no stress on that, that the human being, as painted by Enlightenment thinkers, was, if not economic man, at any rate, some kind of artificial toy, some kind of lifeless model, which had no relation to the kind of human beings whom Haman met and wished to associate with every day of his life. End quote. So, uh, basically, I, I think this is kind of driving to the same point that I was making, that uh, human, human beings and human life is really rich and complex and dynamic, and it is filled with feeling, and it is filled with values. And uh, these feelings and values may come from biological processes in the brain, but um, I think there's a certain degree of arrogance or hubris involved in people who think that they have the capacity, particularly when you get down to, like, 
you know, a, a single person or even a single movement of philosophers over the course of a century, such as the Enlightenment, this movement to overthrow things from the past and create things anew, to have the have the confidence that you are able to define what it is that that a human being is uh, it, according to these rigid principles when your real understanding of, say, neurology is radically limited and 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 I believe is always going to be limited compared to the complexity of the human mind, uh, that's just not, it's not reasonable. I think that a certain amount of humility is required to recognize that you don't really, you can't just put human beings in a box like that. You can't put a person in a library and leave them there forever and let them learn everything there is to know, but have them be there by themselves and, and, and that knowledge or something is going to make them happy. It's just a miss. It's a radical misunderstanding of humanity. So anyway, I'm going to move on at this point to Herder. Uh, and this section is a little bit longer, but this section starts to get a little bit more into some political perspectives that we can infer from the Romantic movement and the Romantic mindset. And so I think this part is particularly important to uh, to where I'm trying to go with this podcast. So uh, he says, quote, In the aesthetics of the 18th century, even the much more passionate aesthetics of someone like Diderot, as compared with the dry and conventional aesthetics of the Abbe Bateau. Broadly speaking, the value of a work of art would be said to consist in its being what it was. So, the value of a picture was that it was beautiful. What made it beautiful, one could argue about. Whether it was because it gave pleasure, whether it was because it satisfied the intellect, whether it was because it had some particular relation, whether it was because it had some peculiar relation to the harmonies of the spheres or of the universe, and was a copy of some great platonic original to which the artist in a moment of inspiration had access, about that you might disagree. What everyone agreed about was that the value of a work of art consisted in the properties which it had, its being what it was, beautiful, symmetrical, shapely, whatever it might be. A silver bowl was beautiful because it was a beautiful bowl, because it had the properties of being beautiful, however that is defined. This had nothing to do with who made it, and it had nothing to do with why it was made. The artist took very much the position of a purveyor who said, My private life is no business of the man who buys the work of art. You have asked for a silver bowl. Here it is. I provide it. It is no business of yours whether I am a good husband or a good voter or a nice man or believe in God. You have asked for a table. Here is a table. If it is a solid, sound table such as you need, what complaints can you have? You have asked for a painting. You have asked for a portrait. If it is a good portrait, take it. I am Mozart. I am Hayden. I hope to produce a beautiful musical composition by which I mean one which will be recognized as beautiful by others and for which I shall be paid an adequate commission, and which will perhaps make my name as an immortal artist. That is the normal 18th century view, and it is the view of a great many people, indeed probably the majority since. This was not the view which the Germans, with whom we are concerned, took, particularly not Hamann's view, and certainly not Herder's. For them, a work of art is the expression of somebody. It is always a voice speaking. A work of art is the voice of one man addressing himself to other men, whether it be a silver bowl or a musical composition or a poem or even a code of laws, whatever it might be, any artifact of human hands is in some way the expression of the attitude to life, conscious or unconscious, of its maker. When we appreciate a work of art, we are put in some kind of contact with the man who made it, and it speaks to us. That is the doctrine. Therefore, the idea that an artist should say, as an artist, I do this, and as a voter or husband, I do that, the very notion that I can chop myself up into compartments and say that with one hand I do one thing, and this has nothing to do with what my other hand is doing, that my private convictions have nothing to do with the speeches which I put into the mouths of the characters in my tragedy, that I am simply a purveyor, 
that what must be judged is the work of art and not the maker, that the biography, the psychology, the purposes, the whole substance of the artist is irrelevant to the work of art. That doctrine was rejected with violence by Herder and by those who followed him. Take, for example, folk song. If a folk song speaks to you, they said, it is because the people who made it were Germans like yourself, and they spoke to you, who belong with them in the same society. And because they were Germans, they used particular nuances, they used particular successions of sounds, they used particular words, which, being in some way connected and swimming on the great tide of words and symbols and experience upon which all Germans swim, have something particular to say to certain persons, which they cannot say to other certain persons. The Portuguese cannot understand the inwardness of a German song, as a German can, and a German cannot understand the inwardness of a Portuguese song. And the very fact that there is such a thing as inwardness at all in these songs is an argument for supposing that these are not simply objects, like objects in nature which do not speak. They are artifacts. That is to say, something which a man has made for the purpose of communicating with another man. This is the doctrine of art as expression, the doctrine of art as communication. Herder goes on from this to develop the thesis in the most poetical and imaginative manner. He says that some things are made by individuals, and other things are made by groups. Some things are made consciously, and other things are made unconsciously. If you ask, who has made folk song? Who has made folk dancing? Who has made the German laws? Who has made German morals? Who has made the institutions under which we live? You cannot give the answer. This lies shrouded in the mists of impersonal antiquity. Nevertheless, men have made these things. The world is what men have made of it. Our world, our German world, is constructed by other Germans. And that is why it smells and feels and looks and sounds to us as it does. From this, he developed the notion that every man seeks to belong to some kind of group, or, in fact, does belong to it, and if taken out of it, will feel alien and not at home. The whole notion of being at home, or being cut off from one's natural roots, the whole idea of roots, the whole idea of belonging to a group, a sect, a movement, was invented largely by Herder. There are anticipations of this in Vico's marvelous work, The New Science, but this had been forgotten, and although Herder might have seen it in the late 1770s, he appears to have developed most of his ideas before any date at which he is likely to have seen this work by his great Italian predecessor. Herder's fundamental conviction was something of this order. Every man who wishes to express himself uses words. Words are not his invention. They are already passed on to him in some kind of inherited stream of traditional images. This stream has itself been fed by other men expressing themselves. A man has more in common, of an impalpable kind, with other men with whom nature has placed him in some proximity than he has with men remote from him. Herder does not use the criterion of blood and he does not use the criterion of race. He talks about the nation. But the German word nation in the 18th century did not have the connotation of nation in the 19th. He speaks of language as a bond, and he speaks of soil as a bond, and the thesis, roughly speaking, is this. That which people who belong to the same group have in common is more directly responsible for their being as they are than that which they have in common with others in other places. To wit, the way in which, let us say, a German rises and sits down, the way in which he dances, the way in which he legislates, his handwriting and his poetry and his music, the way in which he combs his hair and the way in which he philosophizes, all have some impalpable common gestalt, all have some pattern, quality, in virtue of which they are recognizable as German, both by him and by others, wherein they are different from similar acts on the part of the Chinese. The Chinese also comb their hair, they also write poetry, they also have laws, they also hunt and obtain their food in various ways and make their clothing. There is also something common, of course, to the ways in which all men react to similar natural stimuli. Nevertheless, there is a particular gestalt quality which qualifies certain human groups, not nationalities perhaps, 
Perhaps these groups are smaller. Herder was certainly not a nationalist in the sense of believing that there was some kind of deep, impalpable essence to do with blood or race. All he believed was that human groups grew in some plant-like or animal-like fashion, and that organic, botanical, and other biological metaphors were more suitable for describing such growth than were the chemical and mathematical metaphors of the French 18th century popularizers of science. From this, certain romantic conclusions do follow. That is to say, conclusions which affected anti-rationalism, at least as it was understood in the 18th century. The principal one, for our present purposes, is this. That, if indeed this is so, then it clearly follows that objects cannot be described without reference to the purposes of their makers. The value of a work of art has to be analyzed in terms of the particular group of persons to whom it is addressed. The motive of him who speaks, the effect upon those who are spoken to, and the bond which it automatically creates between the speaker and the spoken to. It is a form of communication. And if it is a form of communication, then it has not got an impersonal or eternal value. If you wish to understand a work of art made by some ancient Greeks, it is no use laying down some timeless criteria in terms of which all works of art must be beautiful, and then considering whether the Greek work of art is beautiful or not in terms of these criteria. Unless you understand what the Greeks were, what they wanted, how they lived, unless, by an act of the most enormous difficulty, with the greatest possible effort of the imagination, you enter into the feelings of these exceedingly strange peoples, remote from you in time and place, unless you try by some act of imagination to reconstruct within yourself the form of life which these people led, what their laws were, what their ethical principles were, what their streets looked like, what their various values were, unless you try, in other words, to live yourself into their form of life, all this is commonplace now, but was not commonplace in the 1760s and 1770s when it was first spoken. Unless you try to do that, your chances of truly understanding their art and truly understanding their writings and really knowing what Plato meant and really knowing who Socrates was are small. Socrates, for Herder, is not the timeless sage of the French Enlightenment, the timeless rationalist sage, nor is he simply the ironical deflator of pompous know-alls, which is what Haman conceived him to be. Socrates is a 5th century Athenian who lived in 5th century Athens, not in the 4th century, not in the 2nd, not in Germany, not in France, but in Greece, then and only then. In order to understand Greek philosophy, you must understand Greek art. In order to understand Greek art, you must understand Greek history. In order to understand Greek history, you must understand Greek geography. You must see the plants which the Greeks saw. You must understand the soil on which they lived, and so on and so on. This, therefore, becomes the beginning of the whole notion of historicism, evolutionism, the very notion that you can understand other human beings only in terms of an environment very dissimilar to your own. This is also the root of the notion of belonging. This notion is really elucidated for the first time by Herder, and that is why the whole idea of cosmopolitan man a man who is equally at home in Paris or Copenhagen or Iceland or India, is, to him, repellent. A man belongs to where he is. People have roots. They can create only in terms of those symbols in which they were brought up, and they were brought up in terms of some kind of closed society, which spoke to them in a uniquely intelligible fashion. Any man who has not had the good fortune to suffer this, any man who was brought up without roots, on a desert island, by himself, in exile, an emigre, is to that extent weakened, and his creative powers are automatically made the smaller. This was not a doctrine which could have been understood, and certainly not one which could have been approved of, by the rationalist, universalist, objectivist, cosmopolitan thinkers of the French 18th century. But a far more startling conclusion follows from this, which Herder did not perhaps himself altogether stress, and that is this. If the value of every culture resides in what that particular culture seeks after, 
As he says, every culture has its own center of gravity. You must determine what this center of gravity, the Schwerpunkt, as he calls it, is before you can understand what these men were about. It is no use judging these things from the point of view of some other century or some other culture. If you have to do that, then you will grasp the fact that different ages had different ideals, and these ideals were each in its way valid for its time and its place, and can be admired and appreciated by us now. But now consider. At the outset, I tried to establish that one of the great axioms of the 18th century Enlightenment, which is what Romanticism came to destroy, was that valid, objective answers could be discovered to all the great questions which agitate mankind. How to live, what to be, what is good, what is bad, what is right, what is wrong, what is beautiful, what is ugly, why acted thus rather than thus. And that these answers can be obtained by some special method recommended by the particular thinker in question, and that all these answers can be stated in the form of propositions. And all these propositions, if they are true, will be compatible with one another, perhaps even more than compatible. Perhaps they will even entail one another. And taken together, these propositions will constitute that ideal, perfect state of affairs, which, for one reason or another, we should all like to see happen, whether or not it is actually practicable or feasible. But now suppose that Herder is right. Suppose that 5th century Greeks could aim only for an ideal quite different from that of the Babylonians. That the Egyptian view of life, because the people who held it lived in Egypt, which had a different geography and different climate and so forth, and because the Egyptians have descended from people with a completely different ideology from that of the Greeks, that what the Egyptians wanted was different from what the Greeks wanted, but equally valid, equally fruitful. And Herder is one of those not very many thinkers in the world who really do absolutely adore things for being what they are and do not condemn them for not being something else. For Herder, everything is delightful. He is delighted by Babylon, and he is delighted by Assyria. He is delighted by India, and he is delighted by Egypt. He thinks well of the Greeks. He thinks well of the Middle Ages. He thinks well of the 18th century. He thinks well of almost everything except the immediate environment of his own time and place. If there is anything which Herder dislikes, it is the elimination of one culture by another. He does not like Julius Caesar because Julius Caesar trampled on a lot of Asiatic cultures, and we shall now not know what the Cappadocians were really after. He does not like the Crusades because the Crusades damaged the Byzantines or the Arabs, and these cultures have every right to the richest and fullest self-expression without the trampling feet of a lot of imperialist knights. He disliked every form of violence, coercion, and the swallowing of one culture by another, because he wants everything to be what it is as much as it possibly can. Herder is the originator, the author, not of nationalism as is sometimes said, although no doubt some of his ideas entered nationalism, but of something, I do not quite know what name to give it, much more like populism. That is to say, to instance its more comical forms, he is the originator of all those antiquarians who want natives to remain as native as possible, who like arts and crafts, who detest standardization, everyone who likes the quaint, people who wish to preserve the most exquisite forms of old provincialism without the impingement on it of some hideous metropolitan uniformity. Herder is the father, the ancestor, of all those travelers, all those amateurs, who go around the world ferreting out all kinds of forgotten forms of life, delighting in everything that is peculiar, everything that is odd, everything that is native, everything that is untouched. In that sense, he did feed the streams of human sentimentality to a very high degree. At any rate, that is Herder's temperament, and that is why, since he wants everything to be what it can be as much as possible, that is to say, develop itself to its richest and fullest extent, the notion that there can be one single ideal for all men everywhere becomes unintelligible. If the Greeks had an ideal which was perfect for them as Greeks, if the Romans had an ideal which was less perfect but was as much as could be done for people who were unfortunately Romans, who were obviously less gifted than the Greeks, at least from Herder's point of view, if the early Middle Ages produced magnificent works in the form, say, of the Song of the Nibelungs, which he much admired, 
or the other early epics, which he regarded as the simple, heroic expressions of uncontaminated, fresh peoples still wandering in the woods, uncrushed by some fearful, jealous neighbors who trample upon their culture in a brutal way. If all this is true, we cannot have all these things together. What is the ideal form of life? We cannot be both Greek and Phoenician and Medieval and Eastern and Western and Northern and Southern. We cannot attain to the highest ideals of all the centuries and all the places at once. Since we cannot do that, the whole notion of the perfect life collapses. The whole notion of there being a human ideal, which it is the business of all men to strive after, that there is some kind of answer to questions of this kind, even as there is an answer in chemistry or in physics or in mathematics to certain questions to which, in principle at least, some kind of final answer can be given, or if not a final answer, at any rate, an answer which approximates to finality, which is more final than any we have obtained yet, with a hope, or at least a chance, that the further we proceed in the same direction, the nearer to the final solution we come. If this is true of physics, and of chemistry, and of mathematics, and, as the 18th century thought, should be true of ethics, of politics, of aesthetics, if it is possible to lay down criteria which tell you what makes a perfect work of art, what makes a perfect life, what makes a perfect character, what makes a perfect political constitution, if it is possible to give these answers, they can be obtained only by supposing that all other answers, however interesting, however fascinating, are false. But if Herder is right, if it was right for the Greeks to proceed in the Greek direction, right for the Indians to proceed in an Indian direction, if the Greek ideal and the Indian ideal are totally incompatible, which he not merely confessed but emphasized with a kind of joy, if variety and difference are not merely a fact about the world but a splendid fact, which is what he thought it to be, arguing for the variety of the imagination of the creator and the splendor of human creative powers, and the infinite possibilities still before mankind, and the unfulfillability of human ambitions, and the general excitement of living in a world in which nothing can ever be fully exhausted. If that is the image, then the notion of a final answer to the question of how to live becomes absolutely meaningless. It can mean nothing at all, because all these answers are, presumably, incompatible with one another. Hence, Herder's final conclusion, namely, that each human group must strive after that which lies in its bones, which is part of its tradition. Every man belongs to the group he belongs to. His business as a human being is to speak the truth as it appears to him. The truth as it appears to him is as valid as the truth as it appears to others. From this vast variety of colors, a wonderful mosaic can be made, but nobody can see the whole mosaic. Nobody can see all the trees. Only God can see the entire universe. Men, because they belong where they belong and live where they do, cannot. Each age has its own internal ideal, and therefore any form of nostalgic seeking after the past. For example, why cannot we be like the Greeks? Why cannot we be like the Romans? which is presumably what French political philosophers or French painters or French sculptors were saying to themselves in the 18th century. The whole notion of revival, the whole notion of going back to the Middle Ages, back to Roman virtues, back to Sparta, back to Athens, or alternatively, any form of cosmopolitanism. Why cannot we create a world state of such a kind that everybody in it will fit smoothly like ideal bricks, will form a structure which will go on forever and ever because it is constructed upon an indestructible formula, which is the truth obtained by infallible methods? All this must become nonsense, meaningless, self-contradictory, and by enabling this doctrine to emerge, Herder did plunge a most terrible dagger into the body of European rationalism from which it never recovered. End quote. Man, I love that section. I just love it. It's a little long. I mean, that was a couple of pages of stuff I read there. Uh, you know, that's a... But it's worth it. Um, I haven't read anything by Herder, but I would certainly like to. Uh, maybe at some point I will review something of his. I only found out about Herder through reading this book, but that seems like a really interesting philosophy, and there's a, there's a lot of ways to open that up and quote-unquote unpack it. Uh, because in a sense, there's a, there's a 
you know, he, he, the author Isaiah Berlin says that, well, that's not really, um, that's not really leading to nationalism, more like populism. But I think in the modern sense of what nationalism is today, as opposed to say what people considered nationalism in the 19th century or, or in the 20th century, um, I think today's nationalists tend to follow along that very same line of thought. Uh, and that's that people, people are, are in a certain place in a certain time. And that, that facticity, if you will, that scenario into which they're born, um, it, it defines them in a way that they, you, you just can't escape from. I mean, you speak a language and the language you speak is specific to the culture into which you're born. You follow a set of laws that is determined by the, by the nation in which you live. Every culture is different and every culture is, 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 it's okay for every culture to be different because each culture follows its own scenario. And so there's no obligation to, um, to join into some sort of global, uh, collective where we're going to homogenize everybody across the world. I think that the modern nationalist says, you know, I think I want to do things, you know, we want to do things our way and you can do things your way and we don't need to all do everything the same way. Uh, let us be ourselves. Let us be Americans. Let us have American culture and let us celebrate American culture. We don't need to spread American culture all over the world. We don't want to spread American culture all over the world be, because in that nationalism, there is actually a, a plurality and a diversity. And diversity is only capable if you avoid homogenization. You can't mix all peoples all across the world all together and have everybody be a global traveler and have any kind of difference between any place from any other place. It's all just going to be a mishmash of peoples. And like Chinese and Italian are only going to be like uh, different different spots in the food court you know they're only going to be choices uh, what are we going to have for dinner chinese or italian they're not going to mean anything when everyone speaks the same language you know um or if everyone's or then on the other hand you know you've got like everybody speaks on your street speaks 15 different languages um because you're you're trying to globalize and and you, you know you're, you're under some assumption that everything is going to be under this homogenous ideal and the ideal is is thorough granular diversity rather than uh, a more a larger scale diversity to have different countries with different cultures different neighborhoods with different cultures um or subcultures i should say you know if you're within one nation then you all you all to some extent fall under that one nation's culture and then within that culture you can find subcultures uh but the deliberate attempt to mishmash all cultures all together all the time in all places that's actually destructive of diversity and i think that's how the modern nationalist looks at this and so i think that uh nationalism and conservatism and particularly Paleoconservatism can look to Romanticism and find uh, some really powerful arguments. Um, and so I think that we should, I think that conservatives and, and, and paleoconservatives, again, in particular, because I think that that paleoconservatism is conservatism with, with a strong streak of nationalism, uh, are going to have to look to some of these historical ideas to bolster their case. Uh, many people have thought about these things, and some very good arguments have been put forward, and maybe in some places where you wouldn't expect to find them. Um, but I think that a that a diehard devotion to, say, John Locke and Adam Smith, um, and and Enlightenment ideals of of pure individuality. I mean, the Enlightenment is really rooted in individuality, individual choice, consent, the social contract, people, you know, it's, it's, it's the individuals. It's all about the individuals. And then it's all about humanity as a whole. Those are the two frames within which the Enlightenment thinkers look at people. What do we all share in common? In other words, what is all about humanity? How we're all the same in certain ways? And then what is 
the individual uh, freedom of expression that the, and and that's okay. That's part of romanticism, but I think it's also part of uh, the Enlightenment. Maybe not the expressive part, but the choice, the part of choice, because like capitalism is rooted in in free people making de- uncoerced decisions. Um, democracy is about free people making uncoerced decisions. And so uh, that sense of, of individual freedom, individual human rights, etc., um, a lot of that comes from the Enlightenment, but it doesn't encapsulate the entirety of the human experience when you don't stop to look and say, how is this group of people different from this group of people? You know, and can we, can we ex- open this up and explore this in a way that's that's positive and healthy that we're not going to let these, you know, these, these conversations get hijacked by people uh, who want to steer them toward some uh, sort of, uh, you know, maybe racial policy or, or what have you uh, that's going to cause people to divide against each other. But at the same time, recognize that, that geography and um, a people, which is ultimately ethnicity and culture are bound together and time placement within time these things these things develop together you know uh, Italy is a place it's a people there's a such thing as the Italian people you can be an Italian right you have and you're of Italian ethnicity but it's also a place it's also a culture you know it's a language and it's a it's a style of dress and a style of architecture and a, and a style of food and and just general relations between people it's a lifestyle it's it's all these different components of culture but it's also, you know, a geographic place. It's also a nation state. It's all of these things. Um, and to, to look at it and say that it has no inherent value on its own, that all the value lies in the individual and in humanity as a whole, that this particular group of people who have developed a particular culture that they share with each other ha- has no inherent value except in, in so far as it can be sold and commodified to other people on the other side of the planet. Um, I find that real destructive. And so um, I think that, that this book and the ideas of Herder and the ideas of romanticism, as I said, sort of serve to provide some foundational supports for... Uh, modern uh, expression of nationalism. And so I think I'm going to leave it at that. I really recommend this book. Uh, I recommend most every book I've been covering. I started out with a few that I wanted to contrast uh, because I wanted to kind of position myself as like, okay, well, I'm not I'm not going to come at this with the standard conservative uh, viewpoint. I'm not going to come at this with the standard traditional naturalistic viewpoint. I wanted to kind of set myself apart a little bit. And so those early books were some books that I, I had to put out there to, to stand apart from. Uh, but henceforth, the books I've been covering more recently, the books, this book here, books I'll be covering in the future are going to all tend to be things, uh, that I more or less agree with, uh, books that I can kind of find, uh, nuggets of wisdom or, or some sort of, you know, some sort of resources that I can use as a, as a foundation for neo-fusionism. So uh, that's all for today. Thank you for listening. Uh, be sure to check me out on Facebook and follow me on Twitter and uh, and like me on Facebook and check out my Patreon page if you, if you like what you hear and you want to help support the show. Um, there's certainly resources that I could use to make the show better, to spread the word to more people. Um, I'm sure you can understand that podcasting you know you can do podcasting on the cheap i kind of do podcasting on the cheap but you know the books cost money um maybe improving my studio to improve the sound quality and doing some advertising and and things like that there are all sorts of things that i would like to do to expand this podcast and i can't do it without your help so uh, if you like it and you agree with it then go to patreon.com slash neofusionist and and become one of my patrons so uh I'll see you next time. Bye.